Well, today is the last message in the Front Porch Life series, and so if you are joining for the very first time, you're in for a treat today. In the book of Revelation, it's really interesting because it's the first, it's the only book in the Bible that we have Jesus addressing churches, individual churches, through messengers. And so what you're going to see in the very first words, it says, to the angel of the church in Ephesus. And so Some people, I've heard people teach that there's a guardian angel, that every church has a guardian angel, yet it doesn't make sense that God, that Jesus would have John write a letter to a spiritual being, (laughs) right? So Jesus would go straight to the angel, right? So Jesus never calls people to tell angels what to do, ever. So it's not that Jesus is addressing John to write a letter to an angel. The word angel means messenger, angelos, it means messenger, And so most likely he's referring to the spiritual leadership of the local church, of the the church that's in that area. You know, and some people believe that this was the Apostle Timothy, I mean, Apostle Paul's spiritual son, Timothy, was most likely the the senior pastor, if you will, or the, the leader of the church in Ephesus. But regardless, he's writing to a church that had been established and was the leading church in the entire region. It was the largest, it was a big, huge congregation. And they weren't like meeting like this. They were meeting in house to house. It was a lot of underground, but they were very, very effective and they were very organized and they had a lot of resources. And scripture tells us all the things they were, they were doing well and then it brings correction to them. And it goes like this. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars. And if you read Revelation 1 verse 20, Revelation verse 1 yeah, verse 20, It says that the stars are the local church, the the messengers. The star are the messenger. And then it says, in his right hand, it walks among the seven golden lampstands, which means Jesus is the one who holds the leadership in his hand and walks among the churches. Right? So he's spiritually present here. He works through messengers, through, through leadership, and he walks among us. He's among us. And he says this. I know your deeds. Like he knows what we're doing with the money that's provided here. He knows who we're serving and he knows who we're not. He knows whose names are written on the make room wall. He knows who are welcome here and who's not welcome here. He knows what's happening in the kids' rooms. Come on. He knows the people that are serving every single week and need some relief. Come on, somebody. He knows everyone who's carrying the weight. He knows everything everybody's doing. He knows who's showing up and he knows who's growing up. Can I get an amen? He knows. I walk among, I see your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people. Like you really hate sin that's growing in the culture. And he says, I know that that, that you've tested those who claim to be apostles but are not. Like you have really good systems for testing false apostles and false teachers and false doctrine even. And he says, you've persevered and have endured hardships. You've been through famine. You've been through disease. You've been through persecution. I've seen you endure hardship for my name, and you're not getting tired. Like, you're not even getting tired of the world. Like, how many of y'all would be like, I want to be like that church? I mean, that's a great list. But he has a, he has a, a really strong clause here where he says, yet I hold this against you, which means it's something that he has against the church so severely that he's threatening to stop walking among the church. He says this. He says, watch this very clear. He says, I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. You've lost your heart. You've lost your affection. Consider how how far you've fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, that means to change your mind. Metanoia means to change the way you think. If you don't repent, I'll come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, which means I'm going to remove the divine broadcasting system that's causing you to flourish, and you're just going to be a human organization. Change your thinking. Well, the very first time I preached this text, I was in Maracaibo, Venezuela, And in Venezuela, there was evangelism that took place for two whole months of a little guy who's about four foot ten named Jaime Yuseche. And I've got pictures of us side by side. It's a very funny picture. And I had another guy that I traveled with was about six foot six. I'm six four. And he was uh, right beside me. And and Jaime is like, 
And Jaime, Jaime personally evangelized every single major city in the whole country of Venezuela for two solid months, inviting all the pastors and their key leaders to this conference. There were over 800 pastors and leaders that came from all the areas of Venezuela to come to Maracaibo. And on the very last night, I was preaching a message to this whole group of leaders called Renew Your First Love. And I was sitting on the platform, worship had ended, and there was like a 30-minute like ministry time where people were coming and getting delivered from all kinds of stuff and prayed for and filled with the Spirit, and all things were happening all over the floor. And I remember sitting there on the podium thinking, unless you repent and do the things you did at first, I remember thinking, God, I wish I had a list of all the things the church in Ephesus did at first. Wouldn't that be cool? Wouldn't you like to know what Jesus was asking them to return to? Like if he said, hey, Jeff, return to your first love. Well, wouldn't you like to know what I did at first? Because if I don't go back and do what I did at first, I'm going to lose my whole anointing. Like what, 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 how, what would it be like to go all the way back? And I just heard the Holy Spirit quickly. And I wrote the fastest sermon you've ever seen written. Like I went, he said, look at Acts 19. Paul started the church in Ephesus. And I went to Acts 19, and I saw what happened in the first three years in the church at Ephesus, and it rocked my whole world. I wrote an entirely different sermon, and it turned into like a revival that night. And today's going to be a little bit different, okay? But I want to share a message with you today at the end of this Front Porch Life series called The Spirit of First Love Leadership. And I want you to write down that phrase, the spirit of first love leadership. Come on, say that out loud. The spirit of first love leadership. Come on, let's bow our heads and go before the Lord. Lord, we welcome you here. We welcome you here. I just sense your spirit here so strongly today. It's so fresh. I've just, I've just sensed your presence today, Lord. And even in my office this morning, praying and time with you, I just sense a fresh Awakening, Lord, we're not trying to get back to the Kenneth Hagin days or the, the Azusa Street Revival days. We're not trying to get back to anything. This is a, we need a new anointing. We're chat, GPT, robots, world, we, we need a whole new anointing. It's a new era. We're in a new era. We know we're in the end times and the harvest is ripe. And you are calling your people not to, they didn't, they didn't load up on, on expensive gas and drive all the way here to sing songs. They came to hear from you, God. They came to receive you, to be touched by you. Lord, I, I, I'm not asking you for a, a revivals like, like, like we're in Africa. I'm not asking you for the, the Reinhardt Bunky Millions. I'm asking you for a global harvest. I'm asking you for your perfect will right now in this World War III kind of era, in this this pandemic, uh, right now, that you come with a fresh anointing and you call this group of people to its anointing. Lord, we, we're not trying to, to bring like back 1970s Pentecostalism. We're not trying to revive. Any, we need a new anointing, a new anointing. And I'm asking you, Lord, to draw your people to their first love for you, that you pour out your spirit and power in this room, that you call people out of darkness and into light that you call bench warmers, people just watching Christianity off of their rear ends and onto the front lines of the gospel of the kingdom of God. Lord, we know we can only do this in you, in your name. You drew us here. You started this church. You brought this house together. You brought these precious people together today. And they came to hear from you and not a man. Speak to them today, Lord. Speak to me. Pour out your spirit in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Come on, give him a shout of praise. Yes. Well, I've known my wife, Sarah, since we, since I was, I, I remember meeting her when I was in the ninth grade, but I, how many of y'all have met somebody and then five years later you saw them again and they look completely different? Like when I remembered meeting her, I didn't remember her being as beautiful as she is. And the first time I met her, you know, I remember it was at a, it was, I, I, she remembers like knowing me longer, but I'd never really met her. But the first time I met her in person, she was like a counselor at a youth camp, you know, and um, she's, she's a couple of years, three years older than I am. And so she was a freshman in college when I was a freshman in high school. And that's when, when I remember meeting her. It was her first year as a counselor at the youth camp I was at. And so several years later, like eight years later, um, I had graduated high school and actually finished college and was moving back home. 
And I was in a Bible study at the church I grew up in, and I'd come from Baton Rouge to West Monroe, Louisiana, and I was in Alan Robertson's Bible study that morning, and it was like probably two, three hundred people in the classroom. And Sarah came, walked up, and she stood in front of me, and I looked at her, and I was like, Sarah? And I didn't even recognize her, but I immediately knew, like, I, 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 I'm, I love you, and we're getting married. Like, I, I knew. I just knew it. And she's like, what are you doing tonight? I was like, whatever you're doing. That's, what, that's exactly what I remember. And we started dating. There's a picture of us when we very first started dating. And then, oh, yeah, y'all are saying, oh, because I used to have hair. It fell out because pastoring people like y'all and five kids, not really. But like, we, I, I rem, like when we first started dating, I, I wrote songs for her on a regular basis. I, we worshiped together. We sang, I sang, we worshiped together. I played music. She sing, we'd sing together. I would drive to her office. She was an auto underwriter for State Farm. And um, I worked at AT AT&T Wireless. And I'd check out on my lunch break. And I'd rush over to her place, pick her up, take her to lunch. I'd buy her flowers at least once a week. Everybody in her workplace thought she had the best boyfriend in the world. Because she did, you know. (laughs) I mean, I was was so in love with her. Like, I I loved her. Her, We spent a lot of time. I invested a lot of time. Over the course of time, we stayed pure through our whole uh, dating relationship and, and, and like really, really like valued the covenant of marriage and prepared ourselves. January 9th, we're going to be married 25 years. Come on, praise God. And um, we got a special trip planned for that, and so I'm looking forward to that trip. And um, during our wedding ceremony, some of y'all like hire people that like do this, you get the sand and you fill the sand. Some of you actually get the unity candle and stuff like that. We hired a potter. We got a potter who came, and he set up this potter's wheel on the platform, like out by the side. We had like a, tons of bridesmaids and groomsmen and music and all that stuff, like 400 people at a wedding. And, um, and so we had this potter, and we're standing down there, and this guy, we're standing right beside him, and he took these two vessels, and he, he made these two vessels one. And as we're saying our vows, we repeated our vows, which is written around the wedding invitation there, which says, where you go, I go, and where you stay, I stay. Your God will be my God, and your people will be my people. And may God deal with me, be it ever so severely, should anything but death separate us for as long as we live. You know, and it's this, it's this strong vow. And as we repeated that, we repeated it almost like the cementing of this relationship. There's this cementing of our first love. And what I want to tell you now is that if you would have come to me and told me that you are going to grow more in love with Sarah at year 25 than you are right now, I wouldn't have thought that was possible. I wouldn't have thought it was possible to be more in love with her today, but I'm telling you right now, it's all by the grace of God and the faithfulness of being in a right relationship. I'm way more deeply in love with Sarah today, and I have no hair. Like, this is us now, you know. <laughs> Pastoring for, 20, for 31 years, 25 of those have been with Sarah. Raised five kids. My oldest, our oldest is 22, and our youngest is 12. We've pastored lots of people. We've seen so many people come into Jesus. I've been, we've been in many nations together, done lots of ministry together. You know, and at, at 50, I'm 50 now, and she's a little bit older than I am. And I'm looking at my grandmother who just passed away at 91. And of course, you picture yourself, because unless we both pass at the same time, one of us will be looking over the life or casket of the other and grieving. And I just started thinking about, like, what happens is if, if you get older, how many of y'all know the difference of getting older in Christ and growing up in Christ? When you get mature in love, what happens is a touch on the knee is more powerful than a 25-page letter. A word of I love you and I'm proud of you are so much more deeply impactful in my life right now than, than anything she could possibly buy me. Mature love doesn't need all the, all the fluff. Some of y'all are like, don't say that because I need him to start buying me some more fluff because he's kind of slacking a little bit. <laughs> Maybe so. But what I'm telling you this is if somebody came to me and said, Jeff, your love for your wife is drifting. I want you to go back and do what you did at first. How many of y'all, I would know exactly what that meant. Now, if you're a church and the Lord Jesus says to the church, you're drifting from your affection You're losing the spirit of the church. You're doing all the right things, but you're losing the spirit. Repent and go back and do what you did at first. How many of you would love to have a checklist? A checklist of what did we do at first? Like what what was the heart that you poured the anointing into? What actually happened? And so 
that sent me straight to Acts chapter 19. And so I want to unpack for you, and I'm, I'm not gonna, it's not going to be a, a whole lot of details, but I'm going to unpack for you three first love leadership traits. And one of the reasons I'm doing this, three first love leadership traits, is because the first week of January, I haven't announced this to our staff yet, and I, I'm apologizing ahead of time, but the first week of January, January 5th and 6th, we're having what's called a, a, a Make Room Leadership Summit. And it's going to be an invitation, only. it's going to be invitation, but it's going to be to the very first 200 people who register for this. It's a spiritual leadership summit, calling people. I really believe we're going to have over 100 small groups next year, that many people are going to get involved in discipleship and evangelism. Many people are going to get trained and equipped for ministry and discipleship. And the first 200 that register, and it's not even open yet, it's going to happen. And this is kind of like a little kickoff to that. And I want to share with you what I'm calling three first love leadership traits. And the first one is this. It's called spirit-filled devotion. Spirit-filled devotion. There's some controversy over what the disciples were like in the first century. And whether the disciples that Paul met on this day were disciples of Jesus or disciples of John. I can, I can prove pretty well, and other people say they can prove the opposite. But I can prove pretty well these are disciples of John, not disciples of Jesus. These are not people who have actually entered into a salvation relationship, have been water baptized, filled with the Holy Spirit. None of that had happened. And the Bible says that the very first thing that happened to the church in Ephesus was the Holy Spirit was poured out on 12 men. On 12 men. The Spirit of the living God came upon 12 men, and they immediately entered into the most ecstatic, powerful, heaven-filled devotion an expression, unapologetic, outward expression of their faith and love for Jesus. It says this in Acts 19, verse 1 through 7. It says, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. And there he found some disciples, and those are disciples of John. And he asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Basically, like, are you believers? Are you followers of Jesus? Do you have what happened at Pentecost? They haven't been water baptized into Christ. They haven't received the Holy Spirit. And they're definitely not, in, and they're not, the church doesn't exist in Ephesus at this point. And it says, they answered, no, we've not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. They, they've not even heard. They haven't, they haven't heard of the gift. They haven't heard of the ministry. They haven't heard of the outpouring. They haven't heard of Pentecost. They haven't even heard what happened in Jerusalem at Pentecost. And he said, Paul asked, well, then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. The very first thing, if he came back and said, return, re re repent and return, renew your first love, the very first thing that I would look at is this. Return to your early initial devotion to the Lord. Let me just ask you a question. Do you, do you remember the first moments of being saved? Because there's a difference in growing up in the church and growing up in the Lord. There's a big difference. There's a difference. I, 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 I always pray. Okay? I always read the Bible. I'm so thankful to be like in a job. Like my occupation is like every week I, I come, I, I, bring a, I bring a word. I share the word with you. And every day I lead a staff. And then every, every week I lead in global missions. And all the time, and every week I, I parent five young, young adults and, and children. And, and every day I, I walk in the covenant of marriage. And every day I have relationships with spiritual leaders who see me and hold me accountable. I, I have a lot of reasons to stay in the race. Would you agree? I have a lot of reasons, but I don't have a lot of reasons to do the real thing when nobody's looking. Until you actually experience the weight of what happens if you drift. How many of y'all would say, like, there's nobody holding me accountable for what I do in my private life? Because it's hard to hold a person accountable for what they do in their private life. Now listen to me carefully. I'm not talking about reading a Bible verse and saying a prayer. I'm talking about praying in the Holy Spirit and prophecy. This is the very first thing that happened in the church at Ephesus. They prayed in the Holy Spirit and they prophesied, which means something shifted in the emotional realm and the spiritual realm in their connection with God. You're like, well, how do I pray in the Spirit? Let me give you a couple of examples of this. 
And the Bible teaches in Ephesians chapter 6 that our, the armor that we put on on a regular basis, all right, is the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, right, the shield of faith, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, feet regarded, right, ready with the gospel of peace, shoes. And then it says the most powerful part of spiritual warfare is pray in the Holy Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers. And then it says, if, like, if you don't know what to pray for, the Holy Spirit intercedes through you, which means there's a, there's a difference in just saying prayers and literally spiritually breathing in a language of heaven. And opening up your heart, you're like, well, can I pray in the Spirit in English? Yes, you can. <laughs> this is what it says, all kinds of prayers. You're like, this is talking about speaking in tongues? Sort of. There's a big confusion today in the, in the 1900s in what Pentecostalism is and speaking in tongues versus praying in the Spirit. The book of Jude describes praying in the Holy Spirit as something that builds up your faith. It's prayer that's moved by the Spirit. It's empowered by the Spirit. It's not just writing off your wisdom checklist of God, give me wisdom for my day and give me wisdom for my, my job and help me do this, help me, help me do that, and help me do that. That's, an, that's a wisdom-oriented prayer. I'm talking about first love affection stirred up in your being. I'm talking about what happened to me this morning. I came into the office very early today, and I didn't, I didn't need to actually go in my office and just, just like write sermon. I didn't need to, I didn't need to write the sermon. I, I, I needed to feel and sense what the Holy Spirit is doing in the church today. I needed to see your faces. I needed to see what you're going through and what you're carrying. I needed to see the burden that you carry. I also needed to see the anointing that's on you that's under warfare. I needed to see what you were going through. So I began to pray, and I brought up many names. I walked in here in the, in the sanctuary. I prayed through the seats. I saw several of you. I literally saw a woman with a red jacket on sitting on that seat, right? Like literally right there. I saw that. I saw some. I didn't see anybody with a, with a, with a um, Kansas City Chiefs jersey on. I didn't see that. <laughs> I didn't see that. You know, I'm not talking about, I'm not trying to be spooky with you. I'm just telling you that. I shifted from coming and getting ready for a message to preparing to minister to you in the Holy Spirit. And I went back to my office and I got on my knees and I prayed and I prayed and I prayed and I worshiped and I prayed and I had on music and I prayed and I worshiped. Went outside and walked and came in here and walked and prayed. And there's a big difference in being full of the Holy Spirit and ministering from the overflow of the Holy Spirit and being filled with prophecy and knowing the word the Lord has for you versus going through the routine of doing ministry. Can I get an amen? Amen. But let me ask you this. What happens when you just go through the routine of marriage? What happens when you just go through the boxes of getting up, going to work, eating the meal, saying I love you, a kiss on the cheek every once in a while, and yep, yep, nope, nope, and moving on the day? You, you lose your first love. And when you lose your first love, you lose the anointing of your house because your kids pick up on it. Your children pick up on it. Your neighbors pick up on it. You have to turn it on when other people are coming over. How do you know that? Because I've done that. In 25 years, man, I, some, there's some days where I'm like, you know, I'm kind of kind of kind of glad she's still with me, you know, but I'm kind of like with the, the feeling and affection are lost. You're like, well, what causes that? The same thing that caused the drift in Ephesus. Politics and church, attacks, warfare, perseverance, dealing with church splits and false teachers. Dealing with financial crisis and persecution, all of those things you may persevere and endure, but eventually they cause a leak in the spirit. And I feel like some of you today are faithfully here, but you're spiritually drained. And if that's you, you're faithfully here, but you definitely are not feeling it. The songs aren't moving you and the sermon's barely getting you going. I'm just calling you right now to stir up your affection. And today is a day of a new outpouring for you. And you don't just need it. This city needs it in you. Your children need to see this in you. Those who watch you as a spiritual leader, because I, I am, by God's grace, the one who God moved to this city to start Anchor Church from scratch in my living room. And two other families were with me, and 84 people showed up on the very first night, and that's because we gave away free La Hacienda Ranch fajitas <laughs> in Texas. That'll get them to come. 
And a few people got saved on the very first outreach we had. And then a few more people got saved. And then we, we started publicly, and like 400 people came on the first day, and 200 came on the second time. <laughs> like there's a little drift. And we've pioneered through so much and so much. And I'm just telling you straight up that if I am considered the senior leader, the senior pastor of Anchor, and the elders are the overseers of the church, you are that for your family. You are the angel of the house of your family. You are the spiritual leader of your family. They're watching. Man, I just, I loved my grandmother's funeral. I loved it. My, my dad's, uh, uh, second, his, he has five siblings. And so the second to the youngest, her name is Sally. And she just wept her face off. Literally, I, I and her husband like escorted her out. We had to carry her out because she just wept her face off because she just, she just kept saying over and over and over, I, just, I don't want to lose my mama. And I was like, I don't, I don't want to lose my mama. And finally, one of her older brothers came and ministered to her face to face to get her, like, like, like there's, a, there's a deep connection of what it feels like to, to, to sometimes some things hit you so hard, you don't want to keep going. You just want to go home. But I'm telling you right now, you're here and you need a fresh anointing for this season and to finish your race, and to parent your children, and to parent your children's children, and to influence your influence. And that race is determined by the personal anointing that you carry on a daily basis in your living room, in your bedroom, in your car. Come on. You need a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And this means, listen, it's he's stirring up your affection to pray until heaven moves you, to pray in the Holy Spirit, to pray on all occasions. And this is what I call a spirit-filled devotion. Every single year in January, the first 21 days of January and the first 21 days of August, we set aside 21 days of prayer. Heads up, it's coming again. Like, get started now. What about right now you enter the Christmas season praying for harvest in the Christmas time? That you literally pray about what you're going to do with your resources and time. We have, a, we have a family meeting. I won't give you away the details, but we got a special plan for Christmas this year. The wish list is going to change. All of our kids are going to get an awakening for what we're actually going to do with all of our resources for other people. What would it look like for you to sit down with your family and say, what does the Lord want us to do this Christmas? How many of y'all ever wasted some money at Christmas? <laughs> What if you got intentional and said, we're not wasting a single penny this Christmas? There's intentionality to the gifts. There's gifts of the Spirit going to be imparted to our kids. There's real harvest coming. There's real investment in the kingdom. There's real, real. All of this is not an idea. All of this is stirred up as you pray in the Holy Spirit and the Lord prophesies through you, through your acts, prophetic gifts, prophetic, prophetic services. And that's how the church started. Point number two is this, Spirit-filled discipleship. Spirit-filled discipleship. Discipleship's not a word we use today. We use the word employee or apprentice, you know, or intern or rookie. Come on, somebody. <laughs> or a newbie, um, pupil. We don't, use, we don't use discipleship. We don't use disciple. We don't say, ah, oh, I hired a new disciple today. No, we hired a new employee today. But a disciple in the first century was somebody who was entering in a school as an apprentice a person who was like a newcomer. So imagine with me that you're one of the 12 men and you meet this cat named Paul. <laughs> I mean, the apostle Paul is just amazing. And imagine that you meet him and you're one of the original 12, men or women. You're one of the original 12. And he says, repent, be baptized into Jesus Christ and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And you start praying in the spirit and you never have before. And out of your mouth comes a static worship that's called prophecy. It's the same kind of prophecy that happened through, through all the, the prophets of old. It wasn't like fortune telling and declare. It was declaring the works of God in ecstatic utterances is what it was. And this starts happening in your life. Okay, now the apostle Paul says, come follow me. What do you think day one's going to be like? He's not going to send you off. The Bible says, look at this, it says, spirit-filled discipleship. It says, Paul took the, um, I mean, sorry, verse, uh, verse um, 9. And so Paul took the disciples with him. Well, what is that? That's intentionality. I think about this. I read the book, Never Eat Alone. You know, it's a business principle of don't eat alone, take somebody with you. You know, that life's like, it's too, it's too competitive out there to try to grow a company by just being alone. Like, if you really want to reproduce the kingdom of God in people, like, if you really want to make good employees, like, like they catch more from you than they catch from hearing you. So spend time with them. 
I remember when I was in college, I went to Louisiana State University, and there was a couple of people saved there. And um, I'm kidding, that was a joke. Um, but I took a sociology class, and in the sociology class, we had to do, um, I think, 30 hours of volunteering. And so I chose to volunteer at our mother, Lady of Francis, whatever, I forgot the name of the, the hospital, but I chose to volunteer at this hospital as a chaplain. And so volunteering as a chaplain, I was the understudy of this Catholic priest in the city of, of Baton Rouge, and he'd been doing this. I mean, he'd been doing hospital visits, like, for probably four, longer than I'd been alive, way longer than I'd been alive. And he taught me the routines of how to visit a room and how to, but he didn't, like, read a book to me. I went with him every afternoon for two whole weeks and watched him. And then I would hear him teach, and I'd watch him pray. And there was one day where we left the room, and I could tell he was frustrated, and he actually knew a person, and he knew. And so I, I caught how he handled his frustrations, and I, I, caught, I caught discipleship from him. He didn't teach me discipleship. He didn't teach me how to visit hospitals, but I today, like, I, I, I didn't like, I, I actually chose that practice because I didn't like hospitals. My mom grew up and had over 60 operations on her body. She was always sick. My mom was a prescription drug addict. And many times I'd come home and my mom would be passed out on the floor. And one time she was passed out on the floor and I literally picked her up and carried her to her bedroom. And she had almost no clothes on. My, my friends were in the garage and I was so embarrassed. I, I, I literally chose that volunteerism because I knew I was called to ministry. I knew I was called to serve. And I knew I was called to missions. But I didn't care for the sick. I didn't care. So I literally chose discipleship for the Lord to train me on how to care for sick people. And today it's one of the most effective things God does with me is ministering to people when they're broken, sick, and hopeless. I feel the strongest anointing of God at hospital beds. I feel the strongest anointing when people are on their deathbed. I feel confidence in the faith to pray for supernatural healing and miracles. And it's not because it's my nature. It's because God poured out gifts of the Spirit on me that I've over time have fanned into flame through trenches of working through this for 30 years. It's not something I'm naturally good at. I don't want a church that's naturally good at anything. I want a church that's supernaturally gifted by the Holy Spirit for doing the works of the ministry. That's what we need. Come on, praise him. And so I look at Paul, and on day one, they, they daily had discussions in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. Do you think these guys were skilled to have lectures? You think they were skilled after two years? Intentional discipleship is intentionally doing life with people, intentionally teaching. I was in the first service, there was, you know, one of our, our students who was here at the very beginning, uh, Maddie Grace Gwynn was here. And she and my oldest daughter, Shelby, who's probably serving over in the kids this morning, um, they, they started a small group together in the, I think the eighth grade, maybe ninth grade, at McKinney Christian Academy, okay? And so that's just getting people together for Bible study. And I remember on day one, Shelby started the week before Maddie Grace, and on day one of Shelby's Bible study, like 18 girls showed up for the Bible study. On week two, Maddie Grace started her Bible study, and she'd been at, at this school since she was born. Shelby had been in this school for like one year. And on the, the second week of Shelby's Bible study, two girls came to her Bible study, and 15 were at Maddie Grace's Bible study. And Shelby came home so defeated. She's like, Dad, I'm not doing it anymore. I go, oh, yes, you are. Oh, yes, you are. Well, what do I do with two people? I said, babe, when we started this church, we had 300, we had 300 people like, in, in, in two services. And so we started three services. In one week, we had a full room in the first service, a full room in the second service, and one person in the third service. There were zero people when the worship started. And when I stood up to preach, there was one person in the room. And by the end of my sermon, I think two strangers felt sorry for me and came in. But I'm going to preach in my heart out to one person. The very first domain we bought on our website, the very first website domain we bought was hopeforone.com. That's why that make room for one is out there on the wall, because we, we're faithful with one. You, you, you need an anointing to minister to one. She learned that. I, my two youngest daughters were on the first row in the first service. And I looked at them both and I told them, Madeline, Madeline and Cassidy, you're 12 and 14. It's your turn. It's your time right now to catch wind of the Holy Spirit and making disciples. They, every Wednesday night, they're bringing their friends to, to church. Every Wednesday night. Every Wednesday night, they're worshiping with their friends down here at the altar. 30 years from now, when they're 42 and they're 44, and some bald-headed, sweaty preachers preaching a message of return to your first love. You know what they're going to remember? 
They're going to remember their daddy calling them into discipleship at 12 and 14 years old. They're going to remember the discipline of bringing. They're going to remember their first love, first discipleship, their first hunger for the word, their first prayers, their first repentance, their first time of taking notes in church, their first time of posting something. And then most likely, if the earth is still here 40 years from now, you imagine, come on, you think it's hard right now. It's never going to get easier to follow Jesus than it is right now. And so I'm calling you right now to stir up the affection of Jesus Christ for your first love, the first love of discipleship. And I'm telling you this, the harder it gets, the more miracles God pours out. You look at the next part, it says that God did extraordinary miracles through Paul. Why? Because he moved into extraordinary required territory. He moved into territory where it wasn't fertile. He moved into territories where signs and wonders were essential. He moved into territory where people didn't just, how many of y'all have ever been to a place where everybody gets saved? I mean, it's like preaching in children's church. Like everybody getting saved. Bow your heads, close your eyes. Anybody want to be saved? Me. Like children's church every Sunday. Who wants to go to hell? Not me. Who wants to go to heaven? Me. Like every kid. It's easy. You get 25 salvations every single week in kids' church. I've seen that true in Africa as well. I've seen it true in other nations as well. People that don't have as sophisticated, complicated, and distracted lives are ripe, 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 ripe. You don't need a miracle to get them to say yes, but I know some people that will not believe unless they see a sign. That's all over America. There's no place on earth that needs the miraculous power of God more right now than right here in this city. It is. This is the, this is the Bible belt and the buckle of the Bible belt. And there's a whole lot of people not from the buckle of the Bible about moving here, so it's changing a little bit, you know what I'm saying? There's churches everywhere. People have money. Come on, every Sunday morning, I'm not competing with churches. I'm competing with a lake and a golf course. Come on, somebody. A gym, a TV, a bed. I'm competing with all kinds of stuff. People are so bored with the church. There's a need for the fresh power of God to be poured out. And God's just speaking right now, right now, Jeff, you want to see miracles go into impossible places. And I just believe this. I believe this for you. I believe you. I believe you are going to see miracles as you step into unordinary places. As you step out and do what only God can do. As you step out and go for people only God can touch and reach. And he wants to use you. He wants to reach you reach you, and work through you. The other thing that you see here is that handkerchiefs and aprons were touched and touched the sick and was healed. They were healed. And then it says freedom. There's healing and there's freedom. There's freedom where, like, literally, there wasn't, like, any kind of hocus pocus, like, hey, in Jesus' name, demon, get out of him. And something like, oh, no, no, no. It's like, literally, people are coming into the manifest presence of God, and they're coming in one way and leaving out a completely different person. I've seen that. Unfortunately, I've seen it more in India and in Africa, in the Ukraine, up in, in, in Indonesia, I've seen it more in Latin America where people are like uninhibited. They're not embarrassed to, to let their whole insides become aware, unknown in the spirit realm and fall apart. They're not ashamed to actually be free. So many people in the Bible Belt and so many people in the, in the United States, they're so afraid of anybody seeing them imperfect. People in America like don't even want anybody to know. They're, they're terrified of people knowing how bad off they are. One night we had a... <laughs> One night we had a service at Anchor in 2021, and we set aside $26,000, and we had it on the platform, $26,000 to give away to people who had need. If you have a need, come forward. We, get, we, want, we're gonna, we want to meet your needs. Guess how many people came forward to receive help? Zero. Zero. Guess what happened? Almost, I think it was like $2,800 cash was given. People just came up and started putting money on the, and you'd think, oh, yeah, because nobody has financial needs in McKinney. Oh, no, they all were too embarrassed. They hit me up in the lobby, and for the next three weeks, hey, I was too embarrassed to let anybody know I have need. You're never going to get free of demons when you're embarrassed of being free. You're never going to get free from demonic activity as long as you're embarrassed to say, I need help. You can't get saved until you say, I'm lost. You can't get a need met until you say, I need you, Lord. You can't say, I need help with my marriage until you say, we're about to file for divorce if, if he does that one more time. You, you want to be free. you got to be real. You want to be free. You, gotta, you, gotta, you can't be blaming stuff. And what actually happened in revival, look at Acts chapter 19, verse 17 through 20. 
It says that they, this one guy tried to, he was full of a, a demonic act. He was full of a demon. He had a, a demon in him. And these seven Jews came up to him and they started trying to cast the devil out in him. And they were using the name of Jesus and the name of Paul to do ministry. But they didn't have the anointing themselves. They were trying to do ministry without a relationship. How many of y'all have actually tried to do ministry in the church and hop from church to church because you know your personal relationship with God was dry? You know you were trying to get an office instead of a relationship. You know that the ministry of the Holy Spirit wasn't flowing and you had lost your first love, but you were trying to do the dutiful work of serving and volunteering. We do not want anyone doing the service work of just volunteering with a drifted heart. That doesn't mean quit serving if you have a bad heart. What it means is repent and return to your first love and watch the power and anointing come out. Watch the anointing flow. Watch prayer increase. Watch the altars fill. Watch your small group increase. Watch, watch your, your business increase. Watch your family be restored. And it's not because you have a supernatural gift. It's because you've renewed your first love. Paul came and he started the church in Ephesus. And there was a guy, and I showed you this. I'm kind of out of time here, but it says a number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls and burned them publicly. It said that whenever these, these guys that tried to, like, picture this. Picture, like, a demon-possessed guy comes to church and seven people come up to him and say, hey, and then, in the name of Jesus whom Pastor Jeff preaches, come out of him. And he's like, I know Pastor Jeff and I know Jesus, but who are y'all? They're like, uh, we're just trying to invoke the name of Jesus to do spiritual things. He beat them up until they left the building bleeding and naked. That's what happened to those guys. And when that happened, the Bible says they were all seized with fear. What would it take for the church in America to get seized with the fear of the Lord? Don't play around with the name of God. Don't use God's name for personal gain. Don't say you're a, a Christian first when really you're a patriot first. Don't, don't say, I, I, I love Jesus, but you actually go crazy for a political leader. Don't, don't claim to be a real follower of Jesus when you give way more emotion at a ball game than you do in the sanctuary of God. You can't do that. What happens is you're just invoking the name of Jesus. That's using the Lord's name in vain. You're using it for your own political gain or your own emotional gain. But when it comes down to the real devotion, there's nothing in the closet with you and Jesus. He's not trying to beat you up. He's saying return to your first love, Anchor Church. He's calling me. Let's return to our first love. And fear breaks out. Repentance breaks out. Confession breaks out. And it says in that way the church grew the church grew. In that way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. Number three is this, spirit-filled attention. Spirit-filled attention. This is one that gets me the most. Because when you read, you read this verse, it says, Jeff and the elders of Anchor Church, pay attention, pay careful attention to yourself. Everybody point to yourself. Pay careful attention to yourself. Come on, say it with me. Pay careful attention to yourself. Come on, don't put it harder on your kids than it is on mom and dad. Don't put it harder on the religious leaders than it is on you. Don't preach hard to the kids and not hit your own carpet in prayer. Don't call people into the inner place, the holy of holies, of operating in the gifts of the Spirit, and you just do ministry. No. Careful attention to yourselves, everybody say, and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Now, listen to me. I'm going to take a little bit of liberty here. This verse is specifically talking, Paul, to the elders of the church in Ephesus. Those who were leaders in the first three years. I believe they did what he said. And over time, I believe they lost their first love. Here's what I'm saying to you today. What I'm saying to you today is you have a flock. Who are your people? Who's your ministry team that the Holy Spirit has given you oversight of? Dads, it's your whole family. Single men, it's your area of influence. Single women, all the single ladies, all the single ladies. 
It's, it's, your, it's your friend group. It could be your students in your class. It could be your cheerleaders, your whoever, whoever's in your friend group. Teenagers, students, it's your area of influence. My own kids, it's all those kids we pack up in our car and bring this. It's all your area of influence. Give careful attention. Watch your life and your doctrine closely. For by doing so, you'll save both yourself and your hearers. I'm telling every one of you today, you have a flock. I believe there's going to be over 100 small groups started here in the month of January from people who are walking in the anointing all the way through December. They're going to say, me plus two makes a group. God, show me who you want me to share love with. Even if it's one verse, whatever, pay it careful attention. And you're like, why? Look at the next part. The Holy Spirit made you an overseer. He didn't fill you to give you warm fuzzies with your coffee in the morning under your blanket and your chair. He fills you Come on, to not just sanctify you and clean you, not to just make you holy, but to empower you to change your world, to make room for more, to depopulate hell and to populate heaven, to really change your world. You've been gifted. You've been called. You've been anointed. It's time to come off the bench, out of the stands, and onto the field. Why? Because you're not just caring for people. You're caring for the church of God which he bought with his own blood. Come on, bow your heads and close your eyes right there where you are. Hey, thank you for watching Anchor Church YouTube. I want you to subscribe so that we can let you know when we go live and also when we post new content. Make sure also to leave a comment. Let us know what ministered to you today. Also, let us know where you're watching from and how we can pray for you. And finally, if you'd like to support Anchor right now, you can click the link below and your partnership will help impact so many others. I'll see you next time, my friend. God bless you and best ahead.